Hi, everyone. I hope that uh, you are uh, awake <laughs> after this. So uh, I'm William, and this is Pierre, and uh, we are both from uh, the Network Load Balancer team uh, at Criteo. And today we are going to talk about uh, transitioning from ticketing to uh, load balancer as a service. So this subject, uh, inter inter interestingly, have been, uh, has been um, uh, uh, I mean, you, you will find some connections with the presentation from this morning, uh, of sure, uh, from Booking or GitHub. So, uh, at Crypto Infrastructure, we have uh, lots of different projects, uh, which uh, with, um, some of them are very interesting to us. So, one of them is about replacing our uh, operating system or on our network switches. So, we are using the Sonic Open Source project for that. Uh, we are also um, um, taking care, uh, starting to take care of, the, of our server uh, with uh, the Open Compute projects. Um, so the project I can mention replacing our uh, BIOS and also our BMC. But today we are going to talk about uh, load balancer for sure with the Azure proxy transition we did. So, uh, Criteo infrastructure is, uh, was uh, for a long time uh, a quite big, uh, growing um, bare metal infrastructure. And after a while, we introduced the platform as a service uh, with the, the hosted on Mesos. Uh, and the important thing here uh, is that we, m we made sure to uh, uh, put everything as transparent as possible for our developers. What I mean here is that every application starting uh, on the crypto infrastructure is registering itself into our service discovery uh, console in order to make sure that uh, every service can discover each other for S-Wise communication. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. Um, next. Um, yeah, in the, on the um, uh, network side, uh, we also did some work along the years. Uh, so we did implement uh, the uh, Clo Matrix uh, design, which is uh, quite well known today because it's implemented in a few uh, big uh, companies. So I won't, do, uh, I won't go too much into details into that, but the important thing here to understand is that it made us possible to uh, scale uh, our data center horizontally. And uh, the second point I wanted to mention that every server is able to communicate with uh, another one with the same uh, network uh, costs. However, uh, something like two years ago, there were still some issues to resolve uh, because some network services were still very uh, specialized in a specific part of our data center. So here, uh, for sure, uh, I want to talk about uh, load balancer. So uh, let's go back on the developer point of view uh, at Criteo. Um, back then, two years ago, the developer was able to push its application and trigger everything so that everything is deployed, uh, whether it's on bare metal or a platform as a service uh, for a container. But when it came to uh, going uh, to production, there was lots of missing points you can think of uh, to make uh, um, production-ready applications. So I'm thinking about uh, IP, DNS, uh, TLS certificates, et cetera. So everything was handled uh, by human people, uh, human and uh, so through uh, tickets. So today we are going to uh, try to uh, show you how we did resolve this, this automation part, uh, but also uh, make sure that uh, we can uh, um, horizontally um, uh, extend the load balancer infrastructure without any specific uh, hardware. Um, yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so William mentioned that our transition uh, to microservices has been done through uh, mainly through Consul, because it's a good layer of abstraction uh, for different applications so that they can see, can see the difference between a, a legacy bare metal machine and a container-based solution. And our point here was to understand at that time, it was around 2016, uh, if we can not extend this model to be able to do the same with networking. And uh, the, the goal at the end was for the developer to be able to specify uh, how uh, they want to deploy their app uh, network speaking. So uh, I won't enter too much into some gory details because uh, this morning there was awesome talk about that uh, from Booking and uh, GitHub. But we'll try to focus more on what's specific to Criteo. 
So the, the first thing we did as a, uh, as a team at that time uh, was to define APIs for our end users. And the way we introduced these APIs uh, was by writing our own uh, DSL and API extension for our uh, existing uh, uh, execution environment. And the goal here was to have the exact same primitive everywhere again, so that people can see the, net the network as a flattened environment, completely agnostic from the execution environment. And th this, uh, for sure, was tightly linked to the console registration. Uh, I took a small example here. So you have someone uh, uh, defining an app with a port and with a network service uh, data set, which is, in fact, uh, a matter of adding metadata. Uh, the first part here uh, for these folks uh, are apparently to create a service named super service under the domain crypto.net. Uh, their visibility uh, is, uh, this is a public service, and they have a strategy regarding the DNS uh, entries we will generate. Then they can specify uh, stuff related to HTTP. For example, they want a redirection between HTTP and HTTPS to be enforced. And finally, at the end, they can introduce uh, routing features uh, through this semantic, let's say. Uh, for example, here you see that they almost do a sort of canary, meaning that for 20% of the requests on Foo and Bar, they redirect their traffic to the Foo Bar app, which sits within our DCs. Uh, same, uh, they are able to offload stuff, such as the security policies, to an existing app. So if it fits quite well with the microservice approach, where you have existing service, and that you can reuse them uh, uh, when you deploy a new app. OK, so uh, here is something to mention that is very interesting, is that we, uh, uh, we are really focused on making only feature uh, expressed through intent and never to mention technologies. So that the goal at the end uh, for our team would be to be able to completely swap technologies when we want. <clears throat> and the consequence for, uh, of that also is that the ownership of the network app config has completely moved from our team, the network teams, to the end user. So at the end, it's the developer that defines itself the service and the requirement. So a second thing we had to tackle at that time was the health checks. As you may know, health checks can be very complex, and they should be very close to the application and the developer. And uh, if you envisage uh, loading health checks into all your load balancing technologies, at the end, it could be a mess. And worse than that, it could multiply the source of a check, and uh, consequently, you will end up having a lack of consistency between your different systems. So the idea here is, was also to leverage console and to uh, make it a state reference. So at Criteo, we <coughs> try to contribute uh, publicly when possible. And so this is why we started this uh, initiative and this pull request on console. Uh, to create a dedicated endpoint, and the goal of this endpoint was to, uh, for an existing app, was to be able to retrieve an aggregated view of the health of an application. So let me enter a bit into uh, the detail and what it allows us to do. So we have, on every machine at Criteo, we have a console agent. When an app pops in, there is a registration which happens on the loopback, on the localhost. Then there is a health check mechanism that uh, takes place. And finally, at the end, we can offload the health check traffic to the console agent so that we test both the health, we have an aggregated view of the health, and the network pass. We check also that the network pass is valid and that it works. And finally, we can start forwarding traffic because we are sure that everything is supposed to be healthy behind. How do you do that with a shared proxy? It's a matter of adding, uh, nowadays, it's a matter of adding two lines. Uh, the first one is uh, refer to this new endpoint. You have to specify the name of your app, like in this example, foo-bar. And the second one specify the, the console default port, which is 8500. OK, so if you want to use that on your side, it's uh, available since the version 1.4 of Consul. Uh, and yeah, we are quite uh, uh, proud of uh, this contribution, actually. It helps a lot. So to, um, at the end, we still miss some things. 
right? Uh, William uh, uh, mentioned that people want to have their VIP, their DNS entries, their configuration to happen automatically, right? So here we have the uh, scope of a system. As a specification, the system should take event uh, uh, in entry, uh, it should consume event from the service discovery, and the, on the other side, it should configure load balancers. In the middle, it should grab the missing resource to a different asset manager we can have at Critical, such as an IP asset management system or TLS asset management, uh, so that we can take care of renewing certificate automatically. Uh, but also, it can configure external systems, such as DNS, CDN, whatever you can think about. So at Critical, we did that uh, in two steps. The first one was to create what we call internally a control plane, which basically takes care of consuming events and producing events on, on another end. Uh, the, the, the event production is uh, uh, available through a WebSocket API, uh, which is described with Open API and so on. Uh, and uh, this component, there is one instance per DC, per DC it ensures the consistency uh, uh, when we try to reserve resources. Okay, so the, the second part is what we call device provisioners, and the goal of this component is to translate a normalized event and normalized object into a vendor-specific implementation. So there is one contract and multiple implementation, and at the end, if you want to create your own at Criteo, it's a matter of implementing this. Because as you probably know, uh, nowadays everything is software, right? So, uh, it has been historically written, written in Python, but it's not really a matter of technology because you can swap. There is API for that. Uh, these components run themselves on top of our uh, platform as a service infrastructure in a, a plain container, Linux container. And so here, uh, for example, you see that if you implement the get device and the pre-provision, you enter into a sort of provisioning workflow, and at the end, you are able to introduce a new technology. Now that uh, Pierre showed, you, showed us how we did implement our uh, control plane, let's have a look at how our users are using it. So um, first, um, the, the, the first thing for us uh, which was quite important was to have something uh, fast in, on a control plane. So uh, that every uh, developer pushing a new application can have a load balancer configuration within a few seconds. So here we are talking about less than 10 seconds. It's very important for us because um, uh, if you want to do a test for uh, one hour or less, uh, this is something which can be totally done. Also, as mentioned in other presentations as well, we provide metrics for sure related to everything you can think of uh, related to uh, networks. So we put this example, uh, I think it's the uh, uh, biggest uh, applications uh, at Criteo, uh, 4 million uh, QPS uh, at the time. Um, so that's a pretty huge one. And the, the, the developer can subscribe to those metrics in order to um, um, trigger alerting, for example. Um, we continued this work in order to uh, um, improve in even more the experience from the developer point of view. So as m most of our applications are HTTP based, we by default, we push a, a tag on console which triggers automatically any new application pushed on, uh, on, uh, uh, on Criteo. So that when you push your application without even thinking about it, you get a default load balancer configuration, so you can test right away. So it comes with a default configuration as close as in production, so TLS certificates uh, working properly, or HTTPS rejection, etc. People were starting to use it uh, uh, quite a lot. I, I think they were quite happy about it. Uh, that at some point uh, we uh, got, uh, uh, let's say, some strange surprises where people are starting to use it uh, a lot, especially for this kind of flow balancer which aim to be uh, internal for uh, internal testing. So that's the other side of the picture where start, uh, uh, users started to use it extensively uh, and somehow uh, started to break uh, the load balancer uh, on our side. So that's um, uh, where we introduced uh, the, the usage of the HAPOXY configuration named Tapit in order to make sure that the developer 
developer is aware of, yeah, maybe uh, in this kind of case where you have thousands of instances, maybe this is something you, 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 you don't want to do if you want to benchmark your applications. Please prefer the S-West communication uh, I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation. So uh, it, this kind of incident brings me to uh, how do we actually operate our uh, infrastructure today. So as Pierre mentioned before, uh, we are able to uh, implement any new load balancer technology. So that's what we actually did uh, to, to uh, transfer our traffic to HRProxy. And we were quite, about it, uh, quite happy about it because it permitted to uh, do a very smooth transition without uh, the user noticing it. Um, so as you probably understood, uh, at Criteo, we uh, are talking uh, quite often about big services. So uh, to give you an idea, we have 50K uh, servers uh, across the world, uh, which is quite a lot. So when you need uh, uh, to push a change uh, or, ch um, or new version, uh, anything you can think of, you are, we have a system called choreography, which um, helps you to uh, somehow control what you do on the production. So you select part of, of the infrastructure. So in our case, for the load balancer, by the way, it's between 50 and 100 load balancer. So you select, uh, in our case, 10% of the infrastructure. And when the change is validated, you go on the next batch, et cetera, et cetera. So this is quite convenient because uh, I had uh, some fun looking at, uh, while doing this presentation, how many uh, um, bumps we did for either Archer Proxy or any uh, other software just, such as the kernel. And we did almost 600 deployments over the past two years, which is uh, quite huge. I was even surprised by this number. And why we do uh, that much deployment? Because our team is used to look at the uh, Git uh, um, uh, repository, and once we see an interesting uh, fix, which uh, probably uh, uh, can be triggered on our site, we do a backport and we deploy it uh, um, in a few hours. So that's something which is quite enjoyable because uh, we, we can do uh, lots of development every uh, develop, um, deployment every uh, week. Sorry. So this brings me uh, to another story for the other side of the picture, because of course our team uh, creates a lot of incidents. Um, I wanted to mention the MaxCon. Uh, Willie uh, told, uh, told you about it this morning uh, already. But let's go back on what happened on our side. So basically, uh, we were uh, looking at uh, the number of connections per process. And we said, oh, uh, now we should start uh, to increase it because uh, we are reaching a limit. So let's uh, double the, the, the number and deploy it. So everything seems fine because HRProxy was not doing anything. We are simply doing very simple checks. And after a while, everything uh, started to uh, become strange. So and a few hours after, you are ending up with a worldwide incident. So as you probably already know, uh, when you change the max connection, Edge Proxy is doing its own stuff in order to adapt to the number of file descriptors you put uh, on, a, on, a, on, a pro on a given uh, process. But if it fails to uh, increase that uh, number, um, it, um, it roll back the, the, the value to uh, a po uh, another value which could be lower than you, the previous, previous one you uh, already set. Uh, that's why, in, th in that kind of situation, we don't like HRProxy to take this kind of decision. So that's why we contributed recently in order to introduce this strict uh, limit uh, parameter and make sure that HRProxy is failing completely uh, if it fails to increase this, um, uh, this uh, parameter, th those limits. So now uh, I wanted to talk about uh, our probing system. So um, at Criteo, we have, um, uh, let's say, a given SLA for almost every services we have. And we try to make it uh, as simple as possible for uh, every user in the company. So that to make sure that 
someone coming uh, can have a quick view on our infrastructure and have more or less an idea of if it's going well or not. So here we are talking about only three metrics, which are latency, availability, and what we call provision delay. So provision delay is uh, a process which is trying to add a new service, test it, and remove it, and measure the time between the first and the last operation. It's about what people do at Criteo a lot uh, uh, every day. Uh, what is interesting for us here is it might seem very simple metrics, but at the end, we are quite proud of it because it allows us to trigger, I would say, 99% of our issues. I would say also that most of our bug reports we do uh, for HRProxy are based at the beginning on, this, on those metrics. We bump an inversion, we trigger something weird, and this is based on those metrics. Um, another subject which was already uh, uh, mentioned earlier today uh, was the logging. Of course, this is uh, quite a well-known subject, uh, but at Criteo, we uh, uh, have sometimes lots of requests. So here at peak time on a given data center, it was 2.5 million requests per second. So it's enough for us to uh, just take one request among 100 and give us a, a good idea of what's going on of our, on our uh, traffic. Um, so I won't go too much into details into that because we already mentioned that, but we are starting to uh, use it more and more. And uh, we find it very pleasant because it allows you to take very accurate decision on your production. So I wanted to mention the, the trending uh, topic about uh, uh, re removing TLS 1.0 and 1.1, and that's actually what we did uh, a few uh, days ago by looking at the TLS 1.1, uh, which was under 1%. Uh, of our traffic. Yeah. Okay, so now that our user seems to be happy and now that uh, uh, we are also happy to deploy with this uh, safe mechanism, uh, we can start on our side uh, to move everything uh, without hopefully that the user uh, notice it. So um, here I will uh, only mention how does it integrate in our workflow. Uh, we don't really focus on what's the technology behind. So let's start with uh, where do we come from. Uh, historically, as mentioned by William uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we came from very specialized uh, infrastructure within specific racks in our uh, 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 network. So this is what I call here hyper-converged load balancing. And so basically the idea in this setup, historically, when we started this initiative, was for the, the, the application to register itself, asking for here a layer 7 uh, service to the network, wait for the control plane to locate the correct provisioner, and then ask this provisioner to configure the load balancing technology. And then you have a client which is an end user which is happy, can start making its DNS request and the traffic flow this way. Then we started uh, an initiative to support the layer 4 uh, services. So we can think about SSH or DNS or whatever. And so we introduced a dedicated technology for that. IPVS, XDP, wh whatever you may want. Uh, it's not really important in that case. Uh, and you have the same workflow. An app can start to register and ask for a layer of service, which is layer 4. The uh, correct provisioner is located by our control plane, an event is sent, and the traffic can start to flow the exact same way. But now we, are two we have two different stacks. One of them can be completely uh, 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 replaced by commodity hardware and can be moved within our data center. It's only a matter of having sufficient machine to handle the load, because at layer 7 uh, uh, level, as you might know, uh, there is uh, an issue with an issue. I mean, there are a lot of load that, that is consumed by, uh, the, by handling TLS. And so this is exactly what we did, but this way. And we, are, we think that's a quite elegant way to do that. So we are, again, an app register and is asking for layer 7. A provisioner is located, configured. But then you can redo exactly the same. I mean, load balancer themselves can become client of this system. And so the load balancer themselves, on behalf 
of an existing service can ask the network to give a layer 4 service. And this way, we've introduced this kind of setup with uh, specifics related to DSR and whatever. Uh, again, I won't enter too much into detail, but we were clearly able to decorrelate and to despecialize stuff by uh, reusing our own framework. And it went more and more powerful with time, meaning I can, uh, sorry, forgot to mention that. Uh, this is purely software again, so there is an example here of our network device provisioner, for our HA proxy network device provisioner. And this is done in three uh, very simple steps. The first one is that you have to define a hash check for HA proxy this time. So uh, here the goal is to check that uh, HA proxy has at least one server in the back end. Okay. You register specific metadata. HA proxy is asking for a layer 4 service to the network. And then you register this into console. That's done. Okay, so very simple. So now that we have this, we can go even further. Can redo the exact same thing on the layer 3 level, right? Uh, for example, the layer 4 load balancing can ask for a layer 3 service to the network. And exactly the same, the control plane locate the proper switches uh, in our top of racks, configure the peering session, and then you have a BGP session which is established. Uh, also, you can imagine handling DDoS specifics or whatever you may, you may think about. Uh, it's only a matter of uh, uh, abstraction here, right? Let's continue. Same thing for GeoDNS, etc., etc. So, as a sum up, we moved from a hyper converged service to commodity hardware, and this by using, uh, I would say, pretty elegant uh, uh, service description uh, uh, framework. And the consequence is that we've transitioned uh, from something which, which was very specialized to a cost efficient solution, uh, and with our load balancer becoming plain server in our infrastructure. Uh, so no more uh, 100 gig interfaces or whatever, only plain server, 10 gig interface, and you scale horizontally. So second topic, hedge pops. Uh, again, I won't really detail this schema, but the general idea for, for, uh, for us and for uh, every people that use this kind of solution is to optimize latencies. So historically at Criteo, we were deployed in uh, facilities that were close to our partner for our business. But you can also think about uh, improving the display time for your end user. For example, we display banner to people on the internet. And uh, you probably want to be hosted in multiple places to have uh, fast access to your infrastructure and to your services. So just to mention here that this is very easy to do since HAProxy 2.0, thanks to the pull purge delay uh, option, because it allows you to maintain a persistent uh, connection pool uh, between your HPOP and the origin server. And so you can have uh, really optimized latencies for your end users. Um, as a recap, the goal for uh, edge pops was to reach large population bases and to keep our cost under control, right? Because it's a matter of adding a few machines uh, in a small rack somewhere, and you, you end up uh, optimizing a lot of the user experience. Also, we, have wa we had one concern. Uh, which was, uh, we, proba we probably want to do that progressively and gradually. For example, by deploying ourselves uh, in our own premise in some location, but also to rely maybe on a cloud provider and to uh, uh, boot a VM and install a proxy on it. But also maybe uh, we, want also, we could want to offload that on a cloud provider. And we don't want to be locked, and we want, again, to be agile on that. And so I will do. Exactly the same thing. Again, here, the role of our control plane is to drive our uh, edge pop configuration so that we can choose the appropriate method. We can uh, shift from one provider to the other, and the user is not supposed to uh, uh, suffer from everything. Everything should be transparent and on our side. It brings me to a last point, uh, which is still under uh, study, I would say, uh, which is uh, the value of data you can uh, uh, grab from HAProxy. It has been mentioned a lot. The logs on HAProxy are awesome. But they are so awesome that we started to uh, like index the data and start what we could do with that. And only with the RTT value, uh, it turns out that we will probably be able in the near future to uh, do crazy stuff, meaning 
If I want to optimize my traffic engineering, like understand uh, for one subnet on the internet, uh, which transit or peering I, sh I should use. Or uh, maybe I can improve my GeoDNS database, right? Because sometimes you cannot locate a user. And so maybe we can do the same on our side. We can do something on our side, sorry. At the end, uh, what, I wanted, what I wanted to mention here is that this is clearly becoming a decision-making tool. And for our team, they are, uh, uh, now they are already able to assess if a new data center location and a new topology is uh, um, consistent or not, only with this data. OK, thank you. So this presentation, let's say that it's almost over in a way that uh, we wanted to show you how we use our control plane. But let's go back on a few feedbacks we had along those two years uh, more related to uh, HR proxy. So uh, we. As I mentioned before, we have lots of events on our infrastructure. Sometimes we are talking about a few events per second, which uh, can be uh, challenging at some time. So that's why we try to make use, for sure, uh, um, as much as possible uh, of the API. Um, and when we cannot, um, for, for, of course, we do uh, reloads. Uh, one thing we would like to improve in the following HAProxy version is improving the metrics part. Uh, so I'm especially talking about the counters. So as you can see here in this graph, uh, you can see uh, some holes. And typically, in this case, um, this was most likely some uh, real reloads which were happening because of events uh, from our developers or our machines. And so this is something which is some kind of something we would like to improve because uh, sometimes our users are coming back to us and say, oh, is there something wrong? And uh, of course, there is, uh, everything is perfectly fine. So that's why, that's why this is something we would like to improve. Um, so as you understood, we, are, we have a very high traffic, uh, generally speaking, but we are also uh, latency sensitive. So my point here is that even if we would like to uh, make uh, more and more things into the API, so to load more and more things uh, um, uh, without reloading, uh, it's important for us to find a good middle point between um, adding more things in the API and uh, never, um, uh, never go back to, on the latency uh, part, which is very important for us, uh, and that's why we uh, love uh, HAProxy. So, yeah, I mentioned the, the facts about ro uh, reloading is not um, acceptable if we uh, lose packets, but that's uh, an issue which is uh, uh, fixed for, for a few years now. So. Uh, now I want you to uh, talk um, about another subject about the memory footprint. So we are uh, overall very happy about the memory footprints, but it becomes a bit trickier when you are starting to use lots of TLS certificates. So here I put a, a few examples where uh, you have a few thousand uh, certificates possibly, and uh, you possibly also have a few uh, IP, uh, uh, different IP, which are using the same uh, certificates. So quickly, you can end it up with a very huge uh, HAProxy configs with lots of bind lines. And it can also be worse if you are using the CPU pinning on your configuration. Why? Because you probably uh, know that already, but uh, each new line, each new bind line um, in your uh, HAProxy config with the TLS uh, certificate loading will load a new object uh, of your certificates. So that's something which will be, uh, as we uh, saw in the uh, other presentation, that uh, this will be fixed in the 2.1. So we are very happy about it. Uh, what I wanted to, to uh, highlight here is, even if we uh, do fix this issue, um, this is something which is very important for us, because as you can see on the last um, um, graph with the memory, when we trigger lots of uh, events, it can be very challenging because uh, suddenly the memory can uh, go uh, crazy. So it's very important for us in the future that we can make sure that every, uh, each certificate is loaded, is loaded uh, just one single time. Just because when you reload lots of time your uh, process, it will create a new one with the new set of your uh, certificates. 
So um, let's finish with very, uh, something very positive. Uh, it might seem very normal to you and very straightforward, but uh, overall, our experience uh, those last two years were, uh, very, uh, was very good because uh, we are so happy to be able to uh, rely on the community and also an HR proxy enterprise. So I, a very simple example I've put here to finish that is that yeah, we were using this uh, uh, lots of uh, TCP feature and we triggered uh, uh, something about um, an issue related to a uh, units. And it was fixed something like 20 hours before and backported uh, in 2.0, and it was deployed two hours after. So for me, it's a good conclusion of our work in a way that now that we are able to be so, so much agile than before, um, you, we can s spend much more time on more interesting things uh, on our work. So thank you. Thank you.